Hi, my name is Shatadal Das. Welcome to another learning video on the topic externally gapped lightning arrestor versus non-gapped lightning arrestor. These are two different designs of the same product which is lightning arrestor for achieving transmission line protection. I hope you must have already watched my previous videos. If not, please check out the other videos on my channel. Let's first get an understanding how the two designs appear. The left side image is of a non-gapped lightning arrestor, otherwise known as NGLA, and the right side image is of an externally gapped lightning arrestor or EGLA. Both designs are different versions of line surge arrestor, which are used for transmission line protection. In NGLA, the arrestor unit is connected electrically in parallel to a string insulator or a composite insulator in a transmission line. In an EGLA, the arrestor unit is placed in parallel to the insulator, but they are not electrically connected from phase to earth. Rather, there is a spark gap in series with the lightning arrestor. As per IEC 60099-8, the governing standard for EGLA mentions the lightning arrestor as series varistor unit or SVU. But for convenience, we will call it as lightning arrestor in this video. Historically, gap design was used in silicon carbide design of lightning arrestor. But due to the challenges faced in limiting the follow on current, those design of lightning arrestor are currently not in use. A follow on current is an undesirable condition where the lightning arrestor with a spark gap successfully diverts a lightning surge to the ground, but then is unable to return to the normal high impedance state after the abnormal transient event ends. This causes power frequency current continue to flow through the lightning arrestor with the spark gap. This was more prominent in silicon carbide based lightning arrestor. With the coming of zinc oxide based lightning arrestor, the problem of follow on current is non-existent. Now let's see how the lightning arrestor protects a transmission line from lightning strike. A lightning can hit a shield wire or the conductor in the transmission line. If it hits a shield wire, it will get grounded by the transmission tower. Since the lightning can hit at any location, assume that it will hit the shield wire in between two towers. In that situation, it will be diverted in both directions. Now as mentioned in my earlier videos, depending on the earthing resistance and soil resistivity, a back flash will return back, which can cause insulators to flash over. This flashover will induce a surge in the power lines. It can happen that the same tower where the flashover happened, a lightning arrestor will be installed. Then in that case, the surge will be grounded quickly. If there are no lightning arrestor installed in the tower, the surge will continue to travel over the power lines. If it finds a tower with lightning arrestor, it will be grounded, else it will go to the substation where the dead front arrestor will ground it. In certain remote cases, the lightning strike might hit the conductor directly. In that situation again, surge will travel in both directions. There might be a situation where subsequent tower has a lightning arrestor and the surge gets grounded. If there are no lightning arrestor, then the traveling wave may cause a flashover in some other insulator. The lightning arrestor have to be strategically placed based on detailed analysis. Positioning of lightning arrestor on a transmission tower is a matter of another video. We already know how the non-gap lightning arrestor works from my previous videos. Now let's understand how the externally gapped lightning arrestor works. When a traveling wave reaches till the tower with an EGLA, the gap senses the voltage. Depending on the gap setting, a flashover happens on the spark gap which eventually converts to an arc. The zinc oxide blocks in the SVU conducts immediately and transfers the surge to the ground. As the surge energy is depleted, the SVU unit limits the follow on current and the arc in the spark gap interrupts and the current flow ends. Now let's move to see what are the other differences between NGLA and EGLA. For the NGLA, 
the continuous applied voltage across the arrestor terminals is highest system voltage divided by root 3. The rated voltage of the arrestor is arc fault factor times the continuous applied voltage. In EGLA, the rated voltage is same as the continuous applied voltage. This is due to the fact that the EGLA is meant to handle the lightning over voltage and not the switching or power frequency over voltage. Due to lower rating, the EGLA has 25% savings in terms of zinc oxide varistor usage. Apart from that, since the NGLA has to handle the switching surges over and above the lightning surge, the zinc oxide block used in NGLA is at least one size bigger than the zinc oxide block used in EGLA. So here, some additional cost savings can be expected with EGLA. Moving ahead, since the NGLA connected in the system are always energized, a leakage current continues to flow through the lightning arrestor. In addition to that, the lightning arrestor will continuously dissipate heat generated because of the leakage current. As against to that, the EGLA connected in the system are only energized when a lightning surge of magnitude enough to cause a spark over reaches its terminals. Rest of the period, the lightning arrestor has no flow of leakage current or heat dissipation. This is a major advantage with EGLA. In terms of the protection, the NGLA offers protection against all types of surges, namely lightning surge, switching surge and power frequency over voltage. As against to that, EGLA offers protection against only lightning surge. The environmental effects like pollution, icing and vibration affects NGLA and EGLA equally. So sometimes there is a doubt that spark gap of EGLA might get disturbed due to vibration, which is not true. The gap size is properly optimized. In case of an end of life event like pressure relief, NGLA if connected with a disconnector will disconnect the lightning arrestor from the line and protect the system. A failed NGLA doesn't offer insulation withstand. Hence, in case a disconnector is not used along with the NGLA, then the line will trip and can be energized only when the arrestor is replaced. But in either case, a lineman can easily detect the faulty lightning arrestor and replace the same. In case of an EGLA, during the pressure relief event, the arc is quenched either by the spark gap or by the breaker operation. The insulation withstand of an EGLA is the sum of arrestor insulation and spark gap insulation. So after the end of life event of an EGLA, the line can be re-energized and can be operated for some time till the faulty lightning arrestor can be replaced. But it might get little tricky to identify the faulty arrestor without the disconnector. It is important to note that regardless of NGLA or EGLA, the clearances of the transmission line and the size of the insulator can be reduced due to the fact that lightning arrestor is connected to provide insulation protection in case of lightning surge. One information to be added here, Jonathan Woodworth of Arrestor Works has filed a patent for a design of disconnector for EGLA which can provide a visual indication of the failed arrestor. In terms of the installation, the NGLA is easy to install in both existing transmission line and new transmission line, whereas the EGLA will be easy to install in new transmission line only. But if we look at the number of items required for installation of an NGLA and EGLA, it is EGLA that is better. Please note that the images provided here are for indicative purposes and for the explanation of the topic. Now have a look at the different installation arrangements of NGLA. These are some installation arrangements of EGLA. The source of these images for both NGLA and EGLA are from INMR website. 
So let's summarize our learnings. In terms of rating, EGLA has better advantage since it can be rated lower, still rendering same performance as the NGLA. In terms of cost, the overall cost of EGLA is lower than NGLA due to low energy requirement and simple design in terms of hardware. Hence, EGLA has the advantage. In terms of weight of the product, since EGLA has less material content, the weight is also lower than the NGLA. In terms of ease of installation, NGLA has the advantage over EGLA. Since it is easy to install, NGLA regardless of the new or old transmission lines. In terms of protection against lightning surge, both EGLA and NGLA has the same level of advantage. But at the same time, for switching and TOV protection, NGLA has the advantage. Environmental factors like pollution, icing and vibration has the same level of detrimental impact on EGLA as well as NGLA. In case of end of life event, the insulation withstand protection of EGLA has better performance over NGLA. For optimization of transmission tower design and reduction of clearances, both EGLA and NGLA have the advantage. Leakage current is surely a disadvantage for NGLA and here EGLA has the advantage. Since NGLA is electrically constantly connected in the circuit, its zinc oxide blocks are constantly stressed. Limiting follow-on current is achieved perfectly by both EGLA and NGLA. Finally, it is easy to locate a failed NGLA as against to EGLA. Here, I have assigned score of 1 to EGLA or NGLA or both if they have an advantage and score 0 if they have a disadvantage. We can see EGLA has better advantages compared to NGLA. But this is just my analysis considering the facts that we have. It is up to the customer to prioritize the parameter on the relative importance and arrive on the score based on weighted average. So we have come to the end of this video. I hope this video was informative. Please like this video, give your valuable comments and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you.